All right. Welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, we're here for another uh, Dine-On virtual visit. Today we're doing what we're calling, uh, I guess, an unboxing video. Uh, Dine-On displays modules, bits and pieces, uh, what's in the box. So in our previous sessions, we've gone through user interface. We did a happy hour last week. This time we're going to show you, once you've bought and ordered and uh, get, get delivered your Dine-On system, and unbox it and, uh, and start thinking about putting everything together, what all those bits and pieces are, how they go together, and uh, some tips and tricks along the way. Um, so if you're in the Zoom, you are currently muted. And uh, I guess we, don't, we need to give you unmute power, although it looks like there's right now only a handful of people. But what we'll do is after we go through a particular area or module, we'll stop for questions. Also, we have some uh, of my colleagues here at Dynon uh, helping out with questions on both the Facebook Live feed and the, uh, the Zoom feed. So you can ask questions uh, by either raising your hand and then we'll get to you when we can get to you or by typing them out and then we'll try to uh, get to as many of them as we can. <coughs> uh, let's see, uh, I'm Michael Schofield. I'm our uh, head of marketing here. And in and I'm uh, I'm broadcasting from home, but uh, Kyle, who is one of my colleagues in sales, he's at the office, uh, set up in a conference room with a uh, bunch of stuff to show you. And then we've got uh, David and Josh and Robert and Jeff also here from Dynon, helping out uh, behind the scenes and answering your questions via via keyboards. So. Um, I think without further ado, we're just going to start uh, down the down the unboxing. So do we? So Kyle, do we still have the? Uh, I guess the actual box is is off to the side now, right? Yep, the box itself that everything came in is off to the side at the moment. Uh, we're going to go through all the pieces you see laid out on the table here before us, and uh, we'll start with the HDX display, kind of the grand jewel, if you will. Um, so let's see. I'll pull this box out. This is about what you'd see. And uh, Jeff, if you want to switch the camera over to the high view, go ahead and get started unboxing. So, as we remove the infinite glory of the HDX, presents itself nicely packaged, good foam, held in there very securely. Um, let me pull this guy out real quick here, so you can see. Molly's uh, un unboxing that, you know, so we have custom boxes made for um, many of the modules, including the, and the display. Uh, we have to do drop testing on everything. So what we will do is we'll, once we have a prototype box design, uh, it gets dropped from some certain height to ensure that it can uh, survive shipping and whatnot. The HDX display has, uh, you know, protected film over it. So when you, uh, you could keep that on while you're working on the airplane and installing. But once you um, once you, once you are installed, it's uh, you, you pull that off and remember to pull that off. And, uh, and actually, uh, do you want to just grab the display uh, real quick again, Kyle, and just show the back? Let's just talk about some of the the connections back there. Absolutely. So here's the back. Yeah. So the HDX display has there's kind of three main connectors that you're using there. One is the DB37, that's the, the largest connector. That is where the primary wire harness goes. It has all of your power, your serial port connections. There's the harness there that uh, Kyle is uh, uh, showing below. The two nine pin connectors, they look like what you would, what you, many, if you're uh, a, a nerd like me, you'd think it's a serial port. It's actually what we call a Skyview network. It's got dual redundant data and power uh, so that if there is uh, you know, something amiss in the system, Skyview can tell you about it and go to the backup data path so that, let's say you have a wire fraying on a piece of, you know, metal somewhere in the airplane, uh, you won't be affected by that as, as it cuts through wires. Um, there's an Ethernet port, and the Ethernet port is for uh, connecting two displays together, and that allows uh, it doesn't, it, it's only used for transferring the aviation databases, which is nice. Uh, you can just upload every 28 days to one display and it syncs to the other. There's two USB ports. You'll use those for other accessories like Wi-Fi and video in modules. 
also uh, uh, for uh, plugging in USB sticks for updating your displays. Most people though will remote are going. You're not. It's it, you know you're not going to plug in directly to that port on the back. You'll put an extension cable, and we'll get to that in a little bit. There's a little uh, panel mounted thing. You'll see there's heat sinks or fans. Uh, we designed Skyview uh, to actually not even require the fans. So even if you know you uh, stuck a pencil and broke both of those fans, uh, or if they just both failed, which is you know incredibly rare, uh, Skyview will still keep operating and can sink enough heat. But electronics in general, you know, uh, over time, don't like extreme heat. So keeping things relatively cool is good, especially once things have been, let's say, heat soaked in the sun for a while. So the, the fans can help uh, suck heat out in a hurry. So, so since we just talked display. about it, should we look at, uh, open up the D37 harness real quick, Mike, and talk about a few of the things it does? Yeah, totally. So this comes nicely zip tied and looped together. As Mike said, this is your 37 pin plug that goes into the main port on the back of each display. <clears throat> your backup battery connects through a simple plug and play connector. We stuck an additional USB port in here for you. And most of the commonly used wires are already there assembled, color coded to match wiring diagrams and things that should be twisted together already are. So this takes a lot of the, the labor intensive work away of getting the, the system plugged in. And one thing we do, I think pretty uniquely, is we now have harnesses. We've had this display harness for practically forever because there are kind of a bunch of wires. And as Kyle mentioned, it's color coded to match the manual. So it's, uh, it's pretty easy. But we now have harnesses for just about everything. Um, so you, know, you can save you know, dozens, hundreds of hours, uh, depending on your level of competency with uh, wiring. Uh, but there's, there's not a lot to do in terms of building harnesses anymore. If connecting things together, you still do some of that. All right, what do we got next up? Next up is the GPS 2020, which is our high integrity WAS GPS antenna and receiver. It mounts typically on the top of the fuselage. Some folks put it on their glare shield. In other cases, it can even be mounted under some engine cowlings. Uh, it's a standard format size for the aviation industry. Get it out and get quiet here. Uh, simple puck with a rubber weather seal. Four very simple wires that all go to the D37 harness that we just showed, because the display itself provides the power to this unit so that the backup battery can continue to provide power in the event of an alternator failure in flight. I believe this harness is 15 feet long, so you've got plenty of length to work with to mount it just about anywhere. Yeah, and so, um, with the, so that is unlike, so in aviation, you typically have a thing that looks like this that's an antenna. And this is an antenna, but also the electronics, the actual GPS receiver is in this module as well. So what that means is you don't have any like cumbersome DNC coax cable going all the way, um, you know, around the airplane that often in, um, in other products will, is a source of interference and, and GPS problems. Um, uh, so then you have you know, a couple of serial cable uh, wires and then power that's coming from the display. There are actually two models of GPS that we make. This is the, uh, the SV GPS 2020, which is named because it's a high integrity position source that meets the requirements of the ADSD out mandate in the US. We also have a less expensive GPS, um, which uh, if you're outside the US in many cases, or if you have an IFR certified uh, uh, position source that can be used for your ADSB uh, position, and that's called the SV GPS 250, and that's a call it, it's not low integrity, it's, it's not, it doesn't meet the ADSB integrity requirement. Uh, and so it's uh, 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 less expensive accordingly. All right, next up in the party is the Atahars. This is our air data, or atti air data attitude heading reference system which is really the aviation brain of the whole operation. This is what's detecting your attitude, uh, the pedo, the static, and the angle of attack. Uh, plumbing is all wired to this, uh, and it's, it's the, the driver of your primary flight display. Yeah, so this is sort of uh, the core technology, right? It's uh, all, everything on the PSD is basically being generated on this box. It's got a suite of accelerometers. It's got a suite of rate sensors. It has uh, you know, full 3D magnetic sensors. It's got uh, air data uh, ports for uh, angle of attack, pedo attic. 
uh, when you're installing uh, one nice, uh, they're labeled now, uh, which they weren't in the early Dynon days, but if you're looking left to right facing it, it's in alphabetical order. So APS, Anglo Attack Pedo Static. So, uh, or if you're, if you're staring down the, the barrel of the connectors. Uh, if you don't opt for the Anglo Attack Pedo Probe, you just leave that one unconnected and that's fine. And um, what else? Yeah, uh, so mounting oriented. NPT threading, real common. All kinds of push to connect and other styles of fittings available for it. Um, we do, I don't have one here, but we do offer redundant out of hearse and a bracket that allows you to stack two of them right on top of each other for added redundancy in, uh, in many applications. Yep, orientation does matter. It's, I believe, tabs down, is it connector forward or port? I, I always forget, I think it's- Tabs down, ports forward. Ports forward, right. Yeah, it's connector forward on the old remote compass for, uh, for our, our previous products. And this is the uh, 9 pin connector for the Skyview network right here. And this mm -hmm. little, oops, I pointed that wrong. This is the 9 pin. This is the connector for what comes with the Atahars included in the box, which is your outside air temperature probe. And that again comes with an extensive amount of length, uh, plastic threaded fittings to make it easy to attach to the scan under a wing or, or wherever is convenient for you. Uh, the Molex pins are already crimped on, but the connector is not in yet. And that allows you to pass the wires through a much smaller space without having to make room for that connector. Now, a real common problem is people lose this connector. So I believe in our manual, it advises putting a piece of scotch tape over that connector in the top of the Atahars so that you don't lose it. And if you do, give us a call. And uh, let's see, the, uh, I, I mentioned that um, we have magnetic sensors in there and that's for, uh, for determining heading, of course. And is, is, the, is the magnetometer the next thing up? Yes, it is. So in some airplanes, so that so that Atahars has a couple of a few different requirements. It needs to be free in a place that's uh, relatively magnetically benign, so that we can sense Earth's magnetic field. That's magnetic heading. You want to have it. Um, it doesn't have to be perfectly centered, but relatively inboard. You know, not crazy out on a wingtip um, for the inertial platform for the attitude platform. And then of course you need it someplace where you can plumb your pedostatic and angle of attack um, helpfully. And so. In some airplanes, like let's say in an RV, that's usually in the in back of the baggage bulkheads, but bulkhead. But in some aircraft, uh, particularly in certified aircraft, where you might want to mount the Atahar is right behind the panel, uh, it can be tough to find a place where that's good for the inertial part of the Atahars or maybe the the, the, the pedostatic plumbing. That also is a good place magnetically. And so in that case, we have this, which is a remote magnetometer. So this just outboards the magnetic sensing function, as Mike just described, to a, a more easily mounted place in the, somewhere else in the aircraft. Uh, it as well as a Skyview network connection. It does come with a length of cable on it already, knowing it's often going to be in a difficult place to reach. We at least give you some cable to try and make that a little bit easier. Uh, it, it does need to be oriented the same as the Atahars to within a degree in all three axes so that they're matched up. Uh, you are also able to connect the outside air temperature probe through this as opposed to the Atahars. So if you put the probe in the wing, same wing as the magnetometer, and the Atahars is behind the panel or under a seat, you don't have to run that wire all the way back to where the Atahars is. You have a second option for a place to attach it. All right, next up, I think we're going to show off the Skyview network cables and the hub, kind of the bits and pieces that connect some that of these correct. four modules. So the majority of Skyview components connect via what we call the Skyview network. These are nine pin cables. We offer them pre-made from end to end with connectors on them, as short as this one, which I believe is an eight inch, all the way up to six feet. Uh, in a number of different lengths to make you know the, the wiring length for you just an easy plug and play cable. <clears throat> Beyond six feet, we offer quite long rolls. These are often used for reaching something like a magnetometer. We've tried to be handy for you and we've offered this with the connector already put onto one end and the other end comes with the, pin, the pins connected to it, crimped to it. And that way again, it's easy to pass through a small space. This diameter that's only maybe three eighths of an inch or so is a lot easier to run through the the wing root or something like that and uh, be able to reach. So we offer an assortment of lengths. Uh, most systems, especially certified systems, they require enough components that you'll need some ways to split those plugs because the displays have two each. 
So we offer this five port hub. And in some cases, people will even use two of these five port hubs to have enough connection ports for autopilot servos, uh, magnetometer, atahars, engine monitoring, uh, all, all of those types of things need a network port. And uh, this gives you an easy and uh, accessible way to get as many ports as you need. Awesome. Next up, I think we're going, is it backup battery? Backup battery is correct. So these are lithium ion battery and as such, they are appropriately labeled. And you will notice, or some of you may already be aware that there are shipping restraints uh, that go with sending these. So some of your orders that needed to go expedited, it's a little bit tricky to do that with a lithium ion battery. So that's something to be aware of when, when ordering. And the, uh, the backup battery uh, is, is one per display. Uh, if you're a home builder, you get to choose whether you want zero, one, or you know, two or three if you have that many displays. If you're, in, if you're buying a Dynon certified system, you do need to have one per display. They power the, the, the Skyview display and then the items that are powered by Skyview networks. So that's the Adahars, the engine monitor, the air interface module. Um, what else? I think that's kind of the core component. So basically you have like your, your core flight and engine instruments and your interface to your certified uh, navigator and GPS if you have that on board uh, for an hour. Uh, Skyview manages the charge, so you don't need to do any, uh, any, uh, and so that there's the 37 pin connector that for the display that we talked about earlier, it just clips in like that. Skyview manages the charge. Skyview prompts you for a once a year uh, health test, which is basically kind of a rundown test. So you make sure it's, uh, the system makes sure that it is fully charged. You uh, basically turn off your ship's power. The display runs until it, it, it can't anymore and it basically drains that battery. And if it makes it to, I think it's 45 minutes, it passes. And if not, then you, know, you need to troubleshoot or possibly replace the battery if it's, if it's, uh, if it's old. Uh, and you know, Skyview managing the charge is really kind of neat because uh, for example, you don't want Skyview charging this backup battery off of your ship's battery when the engine's not running. So Skyview knows when, you're, when your engine's running because if the alternator's running, it, uh, you'll, you'll get a higher voltage than if you're just running off of the battery like pre-start or if you just have your master on. So you know, in the, uh, you know, if, you're, if you don't have your engine running, you've got like you know, 12 volt or sub 12 volt uh, battery. But if you have the alternator powered, or you're powering things, you're you know, uh, 13, 14 volts, uh, or higher, and Skyview knows that, it can see that, and it says, oh, I have enough power, there's an alternator here, I can start charging the battery, uh, the backup battery, or topping it off in most cases, without running down the, the aircraft battery. So that is the Skyview backup battery. And I think next we're going to the transponder. Transponder. So, kind of two components to the transponder. One is the transponder unit itself, which we'll pull out of the box right now. The other piece is the pre-made harness for it. Mike mentioned that we have pre-made harnesses for just about everything that needs. So, right to the nitty gritty, this is the transponder itself. It's a pretty small unit, doesn't take up a lot of space, weighs next to nothing. Uh, one connector for the pre-made harness here that brings the power and ground, <clears throat> as well as the data transmission back to Skyview. Uh, there's some loopbacks in the harness as well. And then this is your fitting right here that's going to go to coax, and that's going to go to your uh, rod type or other style antenna on the outside of the aircraft. So the unit itself lives in this little box with a metal clip that opens up, and then the transponder removes. So this gets mounted to the aircraft. You've got a couple of holes already drilled, and there's more you can. Then the service or you know, install quite simply locks into place and locks in much like a lot of car headlights. And the transponder comes in two models. Um, there's kind of a, a higher powered and low powered one. If you're in the US, you basically have to have the higher powered ones to be ADS-B out compliant. And the transponder, it's a Modest transponder. It's basically controlled remotely from the, the display. There's no dedicated uh, control panel with physical controls. Most of the time, you're going to do nothing with it because it, it can automatically detect when you're flying or not and, and change between air and ground modes. Of course, if you're talking to the controllers and get, or assigned a discrete code, you can uh, tap the transponder 
area and then key in your code. And um, the transponder does double duty as your ADSB out device. So it's a Modesh transponder with an extended squitter, which means that it's outputting ADSB out information, including the GPS position and barometric altitude to the a ADSB system. Again, that's here uh, mostly for, uh, for US customers. Uh, so it's kind of a two-in-one device. And like, like many things with Skyview, we give you a module. We also give you a connector pack, which has the pins, the housing, uh, even a little removal tool and everything that you would need to make your own harness. Now, a lot of folks like to make their own harness, especially if it's really, really close, you don't have a lot of distance to cover. It's pretty easy to do. If you don't want to make your own harness, we do offer a pre-made one, which is, I believe it's 15 feet of length, so more than enough to get you going. Uh, and it has basically just four fundamental wires. Uh, power, ground, which go to a circuit breaker typically. Uh, often that circuit breaker is shared with uh, the ADSB receiver, which we'll get to next. And the other two wires just go to a serial transmit and receive pan on the back of the display. So this is really trimmed to fit. Put the thing wherever works for your mounting and installation in your aircraft, uh, run it back to the display, cut it where you need it, and you're well on your way. All right. The so next up, I think it's the kind of the other side of the ADSB equation for US customers, and that is the ADSB S472 traffic and weather receiver module. So here we have it. Once again, it's a pretty small unit. Like everything, comes with a connector pack in it so you can make your own harness. And the module itself is quite small, in fact. Even smaller than the Adahar, so it's in the palm of your hand. Very similar to the transponder in terms of connections. You've got a uh, nine pin connector that goes to the pre made harness or one you're making yourself. And on the other side, there's again your uh, coax fitting that's gonna go out to an antenna. Now we do offer a rod type antenna for both the receiver and the transponder. They do need separate antennas and uh, they should be at least two feet away from other antenna sources on the aircraft as well. So it's a consideration to keep in mind when locating things for home builders and something your certified installer will definitely know off the top of their head. It's a pretty small module, brings you a lot of benefit. And so the, um, the, four, the, ADS, the this module, the 472, is a dual band ADSB receiver. That means it's receiving both on the, uh, the kind of the, the transponder-ish frequency, which is uh, 1090 or 1030, I forget. And then the what's called the, the UAT uh, frequency, which is 978 megahertz. Um, you know, one thing that people don't um, realize all, all of the time is that although, you know, so the weather, the weather is broadcast from ADSB ground stations, you know, around the country constantly and and uh, continuously. So what, even if you had a portable device, you can get weather uh, just like you can with uh, this device. But what a lot of people don't realize is that if you're not an emitter, you're not going to, meaning you're not, if you're not equipped with ADSB out, you will see some traffic. Uh, you'll see people that are equipped with ADSB out. And if you happen to be flying really close to somebody that has ADSB out, you might get the, the, the the traffic that's intended for them. But the way the ADSB system works is that when you broadcast your out, you're basically sending a signal to the ADSB system and you know to the FAA system saying, hey, I'm here. Uh, would you please send me back my traffic? And the thing, the people that you can't see uh, under any circumstance if you have just a receiver are the targets that the FAA is that they can see via radar. So the mode C um, you know, uh, the people that just have mode C transponders, which right now, I don't know what the percentage is off the top of my head, but it's still a really high percentage of the fleet. I think it's still more than half. So it's really important if you're here in the US that you are equipped with ADSB out and so that you're, you call it participating in the system because what is generated for you is a, is a custom puck of traffic around your airplane. So it's basically 15 miles around you and plus or minus, the, I think it's three or 5,000 feet and that is literally addressed to your aircraft. Other people can see that traffic picture if they happen to be near, but if you want the most complete traffic picture, you wanna actually have your ADSB out, which is again, uh, our, is done via our transponder. And then you get it back on the dual band receiver. All right, next up, we have the engine monitor and all of the associated goodies that go with that. 
And that's a lot of goodies. So we'll start at the beginning, which is with the engine monitoring module as well. This looks very similar to other Skyview components that you've seen. You get a bag of connectors and resistors and whatnot that are sometimes needed for smoothing out signals and getting things connected. The module itself is one of the larger individual model modules for Skyview. Most things are pretty small. This one has a, a little bit of real estate to it. You got three plugs, your nine pin Skyview network plug that goes with those pre-made cables. And on the other side, you've got two larger plugs, 37 pin, and this is what we call your main plug. This goes to things like RPM, voltage, oil temperature and pressure, fuel tanks, and so on. The second plug over here is a 25 pin, and these are opposite genders to further distinct, make them distinct from one another. This connector is what's going to all of your thermocouples for EGT and CHT uh, detecting. So talking about CHTs and EGTs, let's get some in the field. So once again, we do offer pre-made harness. This has got six feet of length. This one in particular is configured for a six cylinder engine. So there's 12 uh, sensor wires already pre-configured. Pull that out of the bag. And these do come labeled as well. So you got CHT, three, two, one, EGT, and so. Connector is already ready to go. Very easy to bundle this thing up with other wiring harnesses and pass it through the firewall into the engine compartment. And we give you all of the quick disconnect spade terminals you need to connect onto these open ends of the wire that then plug into the probes themselves. Which, first one we pulled out here, this is a CHT probe and we'll go ahead and get it all the way out of the bag. So in most, most common aircraft, this threads into one of the ports on the cylinder head itself and you actually adjust the height a little bit to where this probe is hanging out in the space, uh, the airspace right up against the cylinder so you get an accurate cylinder head uh, temperature reading. You got a short run of wire, a eh, foot and a half long perhaps, and then the two mating terminals to the, uh, the connectors that come with the EGT CHD harness itself. So a lot, lot of plug and play stuff here. Let's see. EGTs are relatively similar. I mean, we're talking about thermocouples here, so the technology is just about the same thing. The delivery is a little different. The EGT, it comes with a hose clamp that's designed to wrap around your exhaust tube. And we have different sizes of these depending on what kind of engine you're using, whether it's a Continental, Lycoming Superior, or Rotax, or Jabiru. And the probe itself, you drill a hole in the exhaust, and this is the actual temperature sensor that's picking up your, your temperatures for each cylinder. And that again, two female connectors. About a foot and a half of wire, so you've really got a lot of flexibility with, uh, with how you can route the wire and get everything going. Plenty of wire length to work with. So that's EGT and CHT and their pre-made harness. I'm gonna slide all of those goodies over here to this side. The next component is the engine sensor main wiring harness. And this is what goes into that 37 pin plug. Looks kind of like the Skyview D37 main harness for the display, but things are colored and wired differently. Uh, so this, again, six feet long, will reach up into the engine department, engine compartment, and, uh, and be able to have the length you need to get it connected to most things. A lot of folks will be trimming a lot of these things short as well. Some of the other fun engine stuff, more on the across the board size. Start with the Red Cube fuel flow transducer. So this is both a flow meter which gives you an instant fuel flow indication. It is also what is counting and measuring the exact amount of fuel that's gone forward to the engine. Now some aircraft use uh, a pressurized fuel return system, and ideally for those you'd wanna run two of these, one for subtraction and one for addition for the amount that's gone back into the tank. But there's all kinds of debates as to whether or not you really need to do that. Uh, there are several uh, mounting abilities here. There's two holes on either side make it very easy to to attach to a lot of different places. See if I can get the camera to see all the way through there. You've got uh, NPT fittings on both sides, clearly labeled one side for in and the other side for out. All right. So another common thing people ask about, voltage and amperage, the two things you very often are are monitoring closely in an aircraft. 
Voltage is uh, quite simply just wires that are routed to pinned locations in the EMS main harness. Amperage is detected off of this little unit called a shunt. This gets wired into your main battery uh, power supply and is monitoring which way energy is going and how much of it to make sure things are doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, very simple, easy to mount. We do offer a simple mounting bracket for this that can make your installer's life and your life easier as well. Next up, we have the manifold pressure sensor. This is the unit itself. This nipple here is connected to the airspace between you know, your throttle butterfly and your cylinder intake. So that it's, that's the, the manifold of pressure that we're trying to set for, uh, for setting power on fixed or uh, constant speed prop applications. It's a three plug system, pretty straightforward. We'll see if we can get the light on it here, there you go. Uh, it's very lightweight, very easy to mount with two mounting screws. Uh, it comes with a weather pack connector. It's all watertight, comes with the pins and the seals and everything like that to get it all connected up and, and ready to go. Uh, let's see, here is a Cavico oil, well, Cavico fluid pressure sensor. A uh, number of different pressure uh, ratings available for different applications. 150 PSI sensor, which is what this is, is usually used for oil pressure. Uh, can also be used for fuel injected fuel pressure. Uh, we do also have a lower pressure rating one for like gravity fed carbureted applications that are never seeing, you know, more than a few PSI, even with a boost pump. So very, very small, very straightforward, simple NPT threading on the front, a disconnectable connector, makes exchange and service easy, which is also weather sealed with a rubber gasket and comes with plenty of length of wire to fit just about wherever you need it to be and connect up to mating wires on the D37 uh, engine main harness. So. Uh, for carbureted engines, which is what this engine pack I grabbed out of the back was, uh, an option we have is carb air 10. This is a very small probe, a little brass guy that threads into the carburetor. And uh, this, this gives you a couple of things. One is part of your run up. You can get a little bit more of a verification that carb heat's working than just the engine runs a little rougher and you lose some RPM. You can actually watch the temperature rise. The other thing this is nice for is you can set an alert to configure if it looks like the air temperature in the carburetor is getting close to freezing, which as we know is a easy thing to do in a lot of conditions if you aren't uh, thinking about it and paying attention to it. So this can grab your attention before you start to lose engine power because icing's developing. You get ahead of the time warning. Plenty of length of wire. Again, this will go to the D37 engine harness and uh, bring that information to you in the cockpit. Let's see. That about covers everything that we have uh, as far as the, the probes and stuff that come with our basic engine monitoring kit. There are, of course, a lot of other things that can be connected to that harness. Uh, micro switches for gear position, uh, potentiometers that report flat position, uh, fuel tank levels are all wired in through that harness as well. Uh, those can talk to traditional resistive type sensors that are in all your Cessnas and Pipers and beaches. Uh, can also talk with uh, capacitance style that many vans aircraft come with and, and several others. Yeah, so uh, as Kyle mentioned, we have kits for, uh, in, for home builders for all of the popular engine types. So you don't really need to figure out, well, which pressure sensor do I need? We've sort of done the thinking and the research for you. Uh, it all comes in a big bag of, of little bags, uh, everything all clearly labeled and uh, with the appropriate harnesses as well. There are two models of the engine, the EMS module. Uh, one is the SB EMS 220, and that's what most people will use. But if you have a Rotax uh, 912 IS, or I guess the new one, the 915 IS as well, they, uh, that, that engine has an electronic CAN bus that, uh, where it self-reports digitally, electronically, some of, the, uh, some of the parameters from the engine. And so that requires some different electronics that aren't in, uh, in the original engine monitoring module. So uh, if you have the, the Rotax IS engine, you do need a different model of, uh, of engine monitoring module. They're the same price. Uh, you just give up, I think it gives up the, one of the thermocouple connectors that you wouldn't use on the Rotax anyway. So just be aware uh, of that. And, uh, and when we see you ordering a, a Rotax engine kit, if, you're, if you don't have the right engine monitoring module, we, we, we help you fix that before you order it. All right, what's up next? I believe Com Radio should be up next. 
Um, radio. So Com radio is one of our a popular one of our items. Uh, a few different forms and shapes that it can take. <clears throat> Both the 25 kilohertz spacing for U.S. markets and 8.33 spacing is available for European markets as well. Uh, the transponder, I'm sorry, transceiver and radio come together as two kind of fundamental pieces in addition to the Skyview. The first is what many of you have seen before, which is the SVCOM panel. We recently put out kind of a uh, demonstration video of how ways you can use this. Uh, this one is a vertical orientation. There is a horizontal orientation available as well, and you can configure that whichever way you like. So that's the part you actually touch in the airplane. This guy is the transceiver itself. And you'll see it's a lot like the transponder in terms of size and shape. Uh, similar connectivity as well. You've got one connector kit that's going to be going to things like push to talk switches and uh, intercom headset jack. Uh, a few of those wires then will also go from the radio to the control panel itself. And that's how this control panel can control this radio even with nothing else connected to it. So you would have numeric active and standby frequencies just like a radio of old, even if you didn't have Skyview connected to it. And when you add Skyview, of course, then your tower, ground, ATIS, and ATC buttons are all referencing the aeronautical database that lives in the display itself. So the, the radio again, just like the transponder, simple wire clip opens it up and it removes from the mounting tray. So this guy is lightweight, easy to mount just about anywhere you want it. And then the radio just drops right in, sets in place and locks it. And um, so one interesting, so as Kyle mentioned, uh, I guess if, if you go back and look at our virtual booth visit, you we, we speak to all of the, the different interesting features. The Dynon Com Radio really works. Uh, it has the, the normal dial that you're used to, the outer and inner knobs to tune your frequencies, but those buttons are really a game-changing interface. Uh, you know, I like to tell people, I, I fly from Seattle to Oshkosh, and I never spin the knob to tune a frequency. I use the buttons to tune the airport specific uh, frequencies, it, you know, you, you literally, you push a button, you twist a knob for the nearest airport, you say, what's my, my, uh, my AT or my tower frequency or, or common traffic. It's super simple to use. On the back of the, of the unit, so the, the 15 pin connector is the one that goes to the transceiver. And then all of the panel mounted modules, and there'll be a few of these that we're going to show you next, have two of the D9, the Skyview network connectors. And having two of them is really nice because you have one in and one out. So you can sort of daisy chain everything in the panel together without having um, you know, too many extra cables. Also, I guess there, on the back there, there is a red LED. And that can be helpful in troubleshooting when, when everything is working, it, I think it flashes slowly, or I forget if it's slow or fast. But if there's anything wrong with the module or with the connectivity, there's kind of an, there, there are different flashing solid uh, flashing and solid error codes that you can use that are in, that, that are spoken to in the manual to figure out what's up. And of course, if it's not on, if there's no light at all, that's indicative that the unit is either unpowered or not working. All right. So since you're talking about other things in the panel and daisy chains, uh, should we move right to those and then kind of backpedal to the uh, the servo? Sounds good. Right. Set that off on the side. So let's start with the knob panel. So this guy is really useful whether your aircraft has Skyview in an autopilot or not. Uh, this is a simple three dedicated knobs for the most common autopilot or for the most commonly used functions. You've got a heading bug, you've got an altitude bug adjustment and also barometric pressure. Uh, these are all push button as well. Pushing the heading or the altitude will sync it to the nearest figure. And pushing the barrel will either sync the uh, Colesman window to uh, match GPS altitude if you're on the ground, or if it's receiving ADSB and knows the nearest broadcast METAR, pushing that would load up the, uh, the nearest value. Uh, also, if your destination is within, I believe it's 20 miles, this will sync it to your destination METAR so that you are already synced up by the time you get there. Similar appearance on the back of the comm, minus the 15 pin connector to the transponder, or correction, the transceiver. We've got the red light as Mike described, and then again, two Skyview network ports. One can be used as an in and one as an out. 
they're, they're both capable of doing either one, so there isn't a specific one that's in and out, but the daisy chain ability uh, certainly is, is very helpful for wiring and not needing a five, extra five port hubs and stuff like that. So that's knobs. Very similarly packaged. The autopilot panel. And so this gives you dedicated buttons for most of your autopilot functions. I'll try and get the glare off it so you can read those. So obviously autopilot master on and flight director. You've got heading, track. Uh, you've got ability to cycle through nav sources and also to enable nav mode. Uh, vertical navigation, which a lot of you would know is like the glide slope or approach capability. Uh, in terms of altitude, you've got hold, you have pre-select, uh, all those other things. Vertical speed and indicated airspeed are the two ways you can prioritize a climb. You can either set the vertical speed and the, the airspeed is gonna be a result of how much power you're giving it, or you can set an indicated airspeed like a VY or a VX or some higher performance airplanes, you know, you really are flying the speedometer the whole time. So setting that to uh, the speed you want it and then applying full power or whatever's fitting is, is what you get. And these up down buttons are increasing or decreasing the rate of climb depending on whether you're in vertical speed or indicated airspeed. Of course, there is also the level button, which levels you out even from a pretty unusual attitude. Uh, the level button and the autopilot disengage or disconnect button, the master up here at the top, we do offer remote uh, panel mounted buttons for those. So if you don't have room for this whole panel, you can get just those pieces uh, as a separate module. Or in some cases, in a, like a wide cockpit, you'll have this pretty convenient for the pilot, but the co-pilot will maybe only get a level button and an autopilot off button on their side. Now, both of these units, I like to describe as a keyboard and a mouse for the Skyview display. Because everything they do, you can do natively in the display without these. These just give you physical, tactile, this button is always this thing, this knob is always this thing, something that just works. So very, very popular items. Anyone generally who has the panel space to fit them, gets them. Uh, but there are some applications where it's just there isn't enough room for it or, or other constraints uh, make them not viable. So not needed, but absolutely valuable tools, and I would highly recommend. Uh, they are both backlit as well and do dim with the display, as is the comm radio. And the, um, the autopilot control panel is uh, similar to, to the transponder. It's kind of a two-in-one device. It also enables auto uh, uh, control of your your uh, your trim servos and when the autopilot is engaged it will automatically trim uh, those servos so it kind of replaces the traditional you know relay deck that you would otherwise put in in your in your aircraft it's also kind of even though it is in the same box it's a completely separate subsystem so let's say your skyview display fails you still have trim control of the aircraft um, if you don't have this this uh, this module but do have autopilot uh, you don't get the automatic uh, automatic trim, but um, you still get trim advice from the autopilot because it can sense when the aircraft is out of trim, just like you can. It, it can it, it sen it's sensing residual force on the stick or on the control surfaces, so it'll it'll tell you to trim up or trim down. But if you have that module, it'll just do it for you. And since he's talking about servos, let's have a look at one. How's that sound? Mm -hmm. So this is an SV32 servo, which is our lowest strength servo. We do have three grades of strength and then a number of different uh, configuration styles. Uh, so depending on how your aircraft is configured or what its control forces are like, you may have a light, a medium, or an extra strength servo. Uh, we do also have a number of different arm lengths for this that can, you know, as, as with anything, is a, a trade-off between throw and available torque. Even within one arm size, you have three holes to choose from. So within one arm, you've got some adjustability. And there are longer and extra long and short arms that fit uh, you know, in just about any application. Uh, these are also available with a capstan drum, which is what's going to connect to a cable-controlled aircraft. Many certified airplanes use that, uh, where some are a combination of push rods and cables. So different, uh, different applications, the servo mounts a little differently. Um, there are a lot of orientations. There is no way it's always got to be up, down, left, right, sideways. It kind of doesn't matter depending on how your, your aircraft is. Um, 
comes with a length of wire for the, I believe it's seven. Yes. Yeah, seven wires. Uh, these are a Skyview network connection. So they plug into the five port hub. That's why many uh, autopilot applications need at least one five port hub, if not two, to have enough connection ports for all the servos, especially if you have roll pitch and yaw. Now this is a servo wiring harness. It's 20 feet long and you can trim to fit. Uh, in some cases, people with uh, not very large platform aircrafts or places where the servos are very close to each other, you can make two harnesses out of one with some extra connector kits. But we do also include these connectors. There are three of them. The design is that there's one that has female nuts swaged into them so that that can be attached to the servo end and the other end, the two plugs can plug right in and thread to each other. They don't need like a gender changer or something in the middle. So this has a connection for each side of this gap and then a connection, oop, that's off camera, my apologies. Connector for the servo and one connector for each side of the servo wiring harness. So this will plug into your five port hub, these two will plug into each other and you're ready to party. And the one thing that's uh, slightly different about the servos is they do use Skyview network and that's for the, the data connection, but because they are higher, so Skyview network is for uh, fundamentally uh, a, low, a low amount of current. So the Atahars and the engine monitor module and the Airing module, those are all relatively low power devices. The, uh, the servos are pulling amps though, right? They're, they can you know, control your control surface. So the servo wiring harness actually has, uh, although I think it's uh, six or seven of the wires are going into Skyview network, power and ground are getting picked off and need to go to ship's power directly because you actually need you know, a substantial amount of power. So uh, that's all well documented and, and, uh, and just the way the harness is built, it's, it's, it's hard to, to mess up. But uh, just worth noting that, uh, that, the sky, that the servos do have separate power and ground wires for yep. actually providing the power into the servo from the ship. So these twisted pairs are your redundant data streams, A and B. Then red and black, as one would imagine, for power and ground. This yellow wire is what actually goes to a disconnect switch. And this is how you can physically, you know, overtake or disengage the servos. A lot of times this is connected to a momentary switch on a yoke or a panel mounted toggle switch. Uh, it would be used in a, a number of applications from like a runaway or a stuck servo. This is gonna free that up by grounding that wire. Yeah. And there's a, a bit of clever engineering in there. So whenever you press the disconnect switch, there's a, uh, you know, it, it does send an, uh, kind of a digital signal to Sky that says, hey, turn off the autopilot. But whenever the disconnect switch is depressed, meaning like if you're holding it down, the servo itself is electrically like unable to drive. So there's kind of redundancy there in the disconnect switch, which is really nice. There's also, um, I think you mentioned it, but, uh, but there's another style of servo that employs a capstan or essentially a pulley. Uh, with mm -hmm. a bridle cable and clamps for for aircraft, uh, uh, say like uh, the, the one that some of us at Dynon share, Glass Air Sportsman, which has uh, cables and not you know push rods for many of the controls. But for most of let's say like, the RVers, you know the vast majority of uh, of people, and you're you're going to be using these uh, the the servo like you see here that has the uh, the push rod with the the arm. We do also offer a generic push-pull uh, mounting kit, which is a length of aluminum tube with two threaded rod ends and uh, jam nuts that is you know, cuttable to the length that fits your application. Uh, we do also have a number of pre-made kits for many home-built aircraft, um, your, most of your vans, some Sonics, um, and then any certified application, of course, is gonna come with thoroughly designed and engineered brackets and specific instructions for how to install and attach them to the aircraft and, and control surfaces. So uh, some, some of you with the home building will be figuring out how to mount this yourself based on what the you know, forums, community, your own knowledge. Um, and a lot of times you're experimenting with different levels of torque and different levels of uh, or lengths of arm and certified applications. All of that kind of detail has been worked out by us. And that's part of what takes, uh, makes taking autopilot or developing autopilots uh, a time consuming process is working out all those things. All right. Any other Next. points on the servo, Mike, or should I uh, go ahead and move on? I think we think you hit them all.
Okay, great. Some of this off to the side. I think next we're doing, I think, angle of attack, Peter. Is that right? Uh, I have air ink module next. Oh, let's do it. Let's do air ink. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm out of order. Air ink module looks very similar to other Skyview modules. In fact, is even in a same size enclosure as many of the other Skyview modules as well. Most notably, the Atahars. Uh, so this this guy has just a couple of plugs on him, nine pin on one side for Skyview network, and again the red light uh, to indicate status. The other side of this is what's going to go to whatever navigator you've got connected to the system. So this is the go-between box between any of your, your IFR GPSs or full-on navigators that have nav radios, as well as an IFR GPS capability. Uh, there are redundant buses and then also a serial in port, which allows the just a GPS position source to be taken from a navigator as well. And that can be wired and prioritized in Skyview so that as you potentially have failures of any one GPS signal, it automatically fails over to the next one you've prioritized. And this is a means of getting another source uh, into the system. So this guy is the same size as the air data computer, the Atahars. And with this bracket we have here, which I'll open up. This allows the EM or um, correction, the Atahars to stack directly on top of this guy, which makes a nice layer cake uh, kind of back behind the panel. And actually, Mike, if you would like, you've got a camera looking at a set of this at the moment, I think. We can see how that looks installed. Now, let me walk over, spotlight that. So this is uh, one of our demo panels. This is representing kind of a certified installation. And uh, one second here while I unmount this. So what we've got here is, my camera just die. One second, I just inadvertently launched my camera. Yeah, your camera froze, Mike. Yeah, I'm working on it. All right, are we back? Yes. Okay. So this is, uh, so there's the, the layer cake that Kyle mentioned. There's actually another bracket, which I don't think we have here, so you can uh, layer the Erink module, an Atahars, and an EMS all on uh, this tray, which right now is for certified aircraft, but there you see a, a, a newer model coming shortly, and that'll be a, a, a little more universally designed uh, that will be available for everybody. So this mounts, you know, modules. Uh, this particular one mounts the backup battery and uh, really helps clean. I mean, this is an actual, you know, just coming around here, this is the, the panel that I've been demoing from on previous uh, and future uh, uh, virtual visits, you know, so there's a real working panel, it's in a demonstration mode, but this is really how everything comes together. So these are those Skyview network cables that we've been showing you, the hub, everything comes cleanly into it. You have the transponder and the palm radio actually wired up, but you know, you have, you have one more harness going between uh, these devices. The 37 pin connector on, on the panel, of course, it doesn't go to many of the external systems that's over here. Um, yeah, so that's, that's basically what an actual installed, you know, panel looks like. So compare this with, you know, if you have a certified aircraft, look behind your panel sometime. It doesn't look anything like this. It's probably a rat's nest of of, uh, of decades of, of of wiring that's built up. That's one nice thing about doing a dyno on certified installation is that you end up getting rid of all of that along with your vacuum system, and it really just cleans things up. You'll lose dozens, 40, 50 pounds off the airplane between the instruments and uh, and uh, the decades of wiring that it's stored, they're stored up. So I've got one of the shelf trays that you see there uh, already pulled out for you. Uh, and this, you can see the four pre-threaded holes with pen nuts already in them for the EMS module. Uh, so no drilling and tapping you have to do for that. Those three modules stacked up here. Typically an ADSB receiver uh, goes out here on these four holes. And then these two are designed to mate the backup battery perfectly. So this sits on the outside or the inside for that matter. 
uh, and there's usually enough space here sitting for something else. You could put a transceiver there, transponder, five port network hub. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility in, in how you do that. Uh, these do also have pen nuts already in place for the HDX mounting positions. So this panel or this bracket would be physically riveted to your actual panel. And then these threaded holes are what you actually thread the screws in to the HDX. So this, this bracket and your HDX sandwich the instrument panel material itself. Uh, and among other things, that makes a pretty easy service access. Four screws, slide the display out a little bit, and now you can reach parts and pieces back here if you need to unplug stuff. Uh, you don't necessarily have to pull the whole panel out to get a part or a piece out if it needs service or replacement or something along those lines. So now, Mike, I believe we are at the PEDO slash AOA combined pro. Mm -hmm. It's a very popular device of ours and actually something I believe is one of our earliest products as a company. It was actually the first thing we designed. So it was the, uh, you know, our, our founder owner, John Tarode, uh has a connection to University of Washington. And uh, when he heard a few kids out of college and I guess it was two, they, uh, this was, I think, the first thing actually invented it trying to have uh, to be very sensitive to angle of attack and be very insensitive to um, to air speed. So there's a, when you look at the the snout, if you will, it's got a very kind of specific contoured shape that's also resistant to uh, to the airflow changes that happen when you're yaw when you're yawing. And fundamentally, it's really a differential pressure device, right? So as as you you know when you're flying straight and level that port on the underside, so the, the pedo ports, of course, the, the straight on port, and then the one on the beveled edge is getting the uh, air at a, at, a, at a lower pressure when you're flying straight, but as you incline into the airflow, when, you're, when your angle of attack is increasing, you're seeing more come into that lower port, and so that's how we're sensing angle of attack. You end up calibrating this in your airplane by doing a set of maneuvers, basically high speed cruise with a little bit of pitch to show a very low angle of attack. And then to show a high angle of attack, you demonstrate a stall or a series of stalls, or if you have an airplane that you don't really want to stall, which is, uh, which is the case in some like high performance airplanes, you can just show it landing configuration. You just want to demonstrate what a high angle of attack looks like. You can then set a different, you can set a, an, an audible alarm. It shows, of course, on screen. There's a little, there's a little attack gauge on screen. Audible alarm, and Frank actually liked that uh, best. It kind of is a cross between. <laughs> we need to actually, uh, I need to get a, a sound sample of it. So every time when I describe it on these videos, I can play it. It kind of sounds like a digital Geiger counter. So in a tone that's just kind of beep, 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 and it increases in frequency until right at your stall or wherever you have it programmed for your high angle attack, it just goes to a, a solid tone. And so when you have it nicely calibrated, what you end up with is as your, as your angle of attack gets really high around the start of the flare, you start hearing those beeps. And by the time you're you know, nicely in your landing configuration, you should have you know, the high frequency tones or, or the solid tones. Um, it comes in, so what we have here is the heated version, uh, which uh, you could, has a separate remote controller. It also comes in an unheated version, which is identical, uh, except for it doesn't have electrical wires coming out of it. And it also, it also comes in what we call a boom mount for aircraft where you might want to, uh, where you don't want to mount it under the wing, uh, like things like long easies uh, or uh, I don't know the flight design CT uses the boom mount. And that's just a straight shot, straight a shot of, uh, of of pedo 18 inches instead of here it's I think nine or ten with the standard L. The bracket is the standard AN 5812 uh, size standard, which is really common. Um, we also have a pre-manufactured bracket that's designed for use with RVs, and people adapt it for other airplanes as well. But it's really meant for RVs. Those two wire, the, those two uh, pneumatic ports are, of course, it's pedo and angle of attack. Sometimes. Uh, people will mistake that for pedo and static, and it's it's not. In fact, Mythbusters, uh, the the old Discovery Channel show, they were I don't know what they were I forget what they were experimenting with, but they basically they ended up with what was clearly a Dynon pedo probe, and they were and uh, uh, one of them was very you know appropriately nerdily explaining uh, that this is pedo and this is static, and one's you know the 
the, the, the dynamic pressure and one is the still here or but they uh, they got the probe but didn't read the manual and, and we thought that was the static line. Well, we're getting down there, Mike. Um, I yeah. think one of the last things I've got is our USB port panel mount. Let's put mm -hmm. the probe out. So we offer these in uh, three different lengths. There's a one foot, a two foot, and a three foot. This gets attached to the panel itself and gives you a, a cockpit, you know, pilot side, easily accessible USB port that's just extending one of the ports on the back of the display so that you have easy access for regular chart updating, uh, downloading of data logs or software updates, so that you don't have to go feeling around blind behind the display. Uh, a lot of people put them in different places. Some will put two side by side if they have two screens. Some guys will hide these in the glove box of the airplane. A lot of different places that you can put it and a couple different lengths that you can work with. And then what people will also do, so every Skyview display comes with a, I think it's currently a 16 gigabyte um, kind of the Dynon stick. It's not a huge one, but it is about an inch long. But if you, but if you do so end up subscribing to the charts and you will uh, end up, because there's, there, there, it's literally gigs of data and the, the storage inside of Skyview isn't quite that big. Uh, you end up leaving the USB stick connected one per display, and so when you do that, uh, we, yeah, there are there are quite a few different brands, uh, Kingston, Sandisk, on Amazon for like ten bucks a piece. You can get really really tiny tiny uh, USB memory sticks that are you know like the size of a you know a, like a chiclet, like a piece of gum that barely stick out from the panel. So that's a, a real useful way to and then and then um, if you have one display by two, if you have two displays by by four, because then what what happens is it lives in the display, and then when you know tw uh, 28 days later, you get your new cycle. You download it to your computer at home. You then bring it to the airplane. You swap it. You bring the other one home, and you know rinse repeat. So that is essentially a, a fairly complete Skyview system. I think that's almost every option. Maybe it is every option. Whether you're flying uh, an experimental home or a Dynon certified panel, it's the same equipment. And uh, I guess we'll open it up for, yeah, we're actually, <laughs> for, for, for the first time, we're, we're actually kind of wrapping up at about the hour mark. Um, we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, let's see, there aren't too many people in the Zoom, so I'm gonna take a risk here. I'm just gonna like whack the, un, uh, the unmute all button. Is there, is there an unmute all button? I don't even know if there is. Uh, let's see, allow participants to unmute themselves is now enabled. If you have to go ahead and just unmute yourself, and and speak on those rounds and, and answer some of your questions. And I and I know that I've been checking in on the the live Facebook. It looks like there have been a, a lot of good questions there. Uh, from from the Dynon crew, is there anything that needs to be uh, that 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 should be spoken to out loud, or is everything covered? Guess not. Well, Kyle, it looks like you did a great job then. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, how many of, or if anybody has any any thoughts for what you want to see in, in a future uh, uh, visit, or you know, our goal is to do these basically weekly, and we'll of course uh, some of like the virtual booth visit stuff we'll revisit um, more often because that's what we're not going to doing this season with, with a lot of you, and uh, at least until perhaps later this year. Um, are there any uh, sorts of presentations or information that you'd like us to cover uh, while we're virtual like this? I don't think any of them have unmuted themselves. Mike, can you hear me? Herman, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, troubleshooting session will be great okay something that's more support oriented for uh customers that are going through their install yeah that would be helpful for them and for people that are wondering that's a that's a, that's a great suggestion I've, I've been having problems i built an rb10 that i finished about uh almost a year ago 
have twin AFS 5500s in it. And uh, I cannot, for the life of me, get the Seattle Avionics package to load where I can pull up approach plates. And it's just always grayed out, and, and I've never been able to get it to work right. Any thoughts there? The the first, I guess the first question is, and I don't think we have um, anybody from the advanced side of the house, any advanced experts on uh, tonight, but there's kind of two questions. One is, is the data getting onto the stick? That's like question number one. And you should be able to investigate that after you've done the, the transfer of of the, of the data using the, uh, the Seattle Avionics uh, uh, installer program, just by drilling down into the folder, it'll be like a Skyview folder, and then as you drill, there should be lots of images and, and other files. Or if, um, you know, what you can also do is see if, uh, if you, you know, if you're on Windows, if you right click the USB stick and go to, I think, properties, it'll tell you how full or empty it is, and it shouldn't be empty. In other words, the space remaining shouldn't equal um, uh, you know, it shouldn't be the for the space you shouldn't be near zero. It should be uh, a few gigabytes, so it should be substantial. So that would at least tell you whether or not the data is getting on the stick. Beyond that, uh, it should just be plug it into the display and turn it on, and then when you pull up airport information, you should be able to pull up charts and sectionals and uh, other and other. But I admit I don't have any of the let's say like the key possible troubleshooting points um for an advanced display on that particular feature mike i can talk about me a little bit oh yeah yeah please sean. um yeah so uh sean advanced flight um so one thing you can do is use your check about and then you can do map and it'll tell you what um expiration dates um if the data is getting into the EFIS, it'll let you know um, as long as you're running anything newer than version uh, 10 software, the semi-current Seattle Avionics um, will be available um, soon to release uh, our version 16, um, but there'll be an actual extra checkbox. So um, in case you are using the very latest Seattle Avionics that does have that version 16 checkbox, um, you may not have the version 16 software, so don't use that yet don't use that quite yet until we actually release that software. Um, other than that, everything else, Mike. What about uh, the um, requirement to name the volume AFS data? Is that, that is mm -hmm. That is another thing on um, older softwares. Um, version 16, we've rectified that to make it a little more uh, simplified, but you do want to have it all capitals AFS underscore data. Um, as the volume name um are you getting sectionals or yeah i'm getting sectionals but not getting the, not approach the approach plates. plates yeah um the other thing is they do have a checkbox in um the data manager that says uh, um, copy just new or copy everything and you'll want to use the copy everything just to make sure that um, you might not be getting um, the correct files over for some reason. And then you do have to have, um, like if you do a um, direct to, um, you can actually select which airport and then hit approach plates so that you can actually, because it has to be tied to a um, airport. Okay. Well, I'm, I'll try all that and, uh, and see what I've done wrong. But uh, now when, when do you think version 16 software will be available to download? I, I kind of stepped my foot in that one. Um, we are in um, alpha test right now, basically in feature lock. There's uh, no new features going in and they're just trying to solve some um, minor uh, UI uh, related, um, basically the touch events um, to make it a little cleaner because they're, uh, and documentation of, of how that all is, is going to work. So. But if you're on 15, that should work just fine with um, as long as you don't have that V16 checkbox checked. Yeah, no, I'm on 15. Perfect. Thanks. All right. Any other questions or uh, topics for um, future conversations and presentations? Hey, Mike, I have a quick question. 
Yeah. Um, trying to get on the Zoom, I had trouble tonight. Uh, I don't have Facebook, so I didn't have the information. Where are you publishing the the uh, ID and access number? Yeah, a few places. Oh, interesting. So even if you don't have Facebook, I believe the events are, are always public. And what we've been doing, and that's a good point, maybe we'll adjust the way we do this in the future. Um, um, so we publish events both on our, our website under the events, like where you normally find our air show schedule, it's, it's yeah. there. We're also sh sending emails, uh, usually the week of, uh, once we have our kind of our program finalized uh, with, uh, with, again, a link to the, I think to the, to the Facebook page, um, but that should be available even if you don't have a Facebook account, at least the, the events page, which then has a link to the Zoom. Probably what we ought to do is to have a page on our website or put that information on our website in the event. So I think we'll probably do that and be a little less reliant on people finding their way to Facebook in the future. So that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Okay. I had to get my wife to get on Facebook so I could find <laughs> out where, <laughs> where y'all were. Also, yeah. uh, I, would, I would second the idea of uh, technical support. We've had some radio problems and we'd like to talk to somebody about that. Yeah. That's and of course, you know, as far as that's concerned, which, um, because technical support is such a huge topic, uh, is there, like you said, radio, so uh, audio noise feedback, uh, yeah. that kind of thing? Um, and then Herman, did yeah. you have a specific alley that you were looking for? Yeah, I think, you know, Herman and I have talked about this before. I think just a, a general kind of Q&A session where people can uh, get a little bit of support while everybody else gets to, to hear and, and we could line up a slate of our our support, you know, managers and some of the the rest of us that are kind of product experts to, to kind of field some of the the, the questions. You know, um, we've tried not to turn these sessions into you know all of them into basically like tech support, you know, live on the air. Um, but but doing something that's very targeted there, that's something you know we'll definitely do. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions or, or thoughts, I'll let you go have your uh, your Friday evening back. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we do appreciate it. I, I see some familiar faces, uh, people that have been uh, here uh, before, and we appreciate you uh, paying attention and to us and to choosing us. So uh, thanks, and uh, have a great night, everyone. Good weekend.